Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Our town, the show about Rochester, learns about an organization celebrating Indian culture. And we meet the new community development director for the city of Rochester. We also get our fill of caffeine and plant life and meet a local painter. Coming up next on Our Town, the show about Rochester. Coming to you from 125 Live in Rochester, Minnesota, Our Town. We're joined today at 125 Live by Nisha Kurup, Vice President of the Indian Cultural Association of Minnesota. Welcome to Our Town, Nisha. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So you just had a wonderfully successful community event this past weekend. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the highlights of that event? The Utsav Festival of uh, Colors is a spring festival and it is usually celebrated in India and it's called Holi. Uh, we, we usually celebrate it in a small scale but we wanted to open it up for the bigger crowd and uh, with that purpose in mind we also added 5k run, DJ music, food vendors, activities, other um, and, and, and a lot of fun. Uh, it's basically a celebration um, during the spring festival. So a little something for everyone. Yes. Um, what is the mission of ICAM? Our purpose is to uh, connect, collaborate, communicate, and, uh, and create a platform of, uh, to support and serve the uh, you know, cultural and educational needs of the you know, Asian Indian communities in Rochester and surrounding areas. This was founded um, around June 2020, uh, though the legwork has been going on for quite a few months. Um, I'm, I'm, we, are, we have a board uh, and we also have several um, com committees and uh, volunteers. So having started in June 2020, of course, um, I'm wondering what types of support were you providing community, especially throughout this pandemic? Yeah, this, this has just happened, you know, right around that COVID lockdown period. Uh, for the uh, same reason, um, most of our you know, initial projects were surrounding uh, that topic. And we collaborated and connected a lot with many governmental and non-governmental agencies for that. So we did, uh, you know, we had a, a vaccination testing center. We, uh, you know, collaborated with Asian media access from the cities to do that. Um, uh, again, we collaborated with the Minnesota Department of Health and um, other organizations like um, Diversity Council. Under their umbrella, we had a grant, a project healing. And um, um, one uh, activity of that was to conduct surveys uh, to understand the barrier for reaching, you know, to taking vaccinations. And we also conducted vaccination clinics, um, you know, based on the survey. Uh, and we provided uh, transportation and interpreting uh, needs, collaborating with IMAA and other community partners. Um, you know, during the, you know, the second wave of COVID, in India, um, ICAM stepped up our kind of support. We uh, collected fund uh, to collaborate uh, oxygen cylinder supplies. And this was because of, of the impact of the pandemic in India itself? Yes, in India. So we, we kind of coordinated that supply to s some of the lo you know, you know, locations in India. Um, that was a huge effort. Um, again, you know, we wanted to support our families right. and brothers in India. Um, you know, we are all here isolated, we cannot go back and we, this was like our emotional connection. Um, again, um, it, we also created uh, many contents, you know, in various Indian languages related to messaging on, you know, safety, how to say, uh, stay safe, uh, you know, getting vaccination and even prevention. And also did many health seminars uh, virtually uh, really on related topics with experts from uh, Mayo Clinic. Well, you know, we, the, the, the pandemic, of course, is its own set of, of issues. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, just generally in terms of the Indian community here, we know it's so diverse. Um, what are some of the unique challenges that the Indian community faces here in Rochester um, in terms of staying? Um, and how do you, I guess, how does ICAM provide resources and help them stay culturally connected? 
So if you look at the Rochester Indian community, uh, you can see many different groups like the re religious groups, regional groups that speak different languages, uh, you know, that follow different traditions, culture, uh, rituals from east, west, north, southern part of India. And yet we all identify as Indian community. That itself is a challenge. And, and it, it, we also do not have a physical space mm -hmm. uh, to come together culturally. Hence, the, the second generation, they don't uh, understand this diversity and they don't have an opportunity to acknowledge that diversity and feel proud about it. Yeah, and, and, and also due to this uh, limitation, we had to discontinue some of the language classes, cultural classes, uh, talk shows that we used to organize. Since that community is growing and we don't have a, you know, like a space for that. And also for new families, individuals and families who are moving into Rochester to uh, accessing resources from a common platform. Well, thank you so much, Nisha, for joining us and sharing a little bit more about ICAM. Thank you. Are you a green thumb and a coffee lover? If so, you'll want to stick around as we grab a latte in a lush plant oasis. We also meet the new Community Development Director for the City of Rochester. But up first, we explore the work of an artist whose paintings are full of symbolism and a love of nature in this week's Our Culture segment. born creative, I believe. Pablo Picasso said that, that everyone is born an artist. Some of us nurture it and some of us don't. Hi, I'm Brianna Stenzel and I am an, a local artist. Local business name is CC's Collective. CC is short for my middle name, Cecilia. I am definitely a multi medium artist. I like to work with acrylic paint, I like to work with oil paint and watercolor paint, and I even dabble in resin. I was raised in a creative family, and I've been creative since I was three or four, um, drawing, even at restaurants, drawing on all the, the placemats. Um, my grandma kind of nourished my love of painting by um, taking me to like a summer art camp for kiddos. We learned a lot at a very young age. What I like about painting is the freedom that I can express how I'm feeling. I do that based on the colors I use. I do that based on experiences I've lived and had to go through. It's been a, a sort of therapy for me. I was working on a painting of a bird flying in the sky. And at the same time, my grandma had passed away. So what started as a bright yellow painting quickly turned into a dark painting with blue and black and just accents of gold um, to encompass the grief I was feeling. I am heavily inspired by art uh, and nature and music. So I have a lot of birds in my paintings and a lot of plants. I see birds as this pure freedom, being able to fly anywhere they want to. Also, like, they're musical in a way. They sing, and that's one of my favorite things about spring, is hearing them sing. And we've been hearing more and more of that lately, so that's been making me so happy. I also have some work where I've included music lyrics, because I grew up in a musical family. But definitely just a lot of funny, punny things in my greeting cards as well. It's something I'm known for locally. <laughs> my 
favorite moment when painting is when I can lose myself. I struggle with a lot of daily pain. I have some chronic illnesses. And just being able to get lost in my art world and just zone out everything, every pain receptor, and just get lost in my painting is um, really wonderful. One of my favorite show and tell moments was when I was accepted in the Semba Gallery because it is um, judged. So either you're in or you're out, and that was really validating for me when I was voted in. I felt very seen, like I am an artist, I can do this. For more information about this story and other Our Town features, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at KSMQ hashtag Our Town or KSMQ.org slash Our Town. Hello, this is Danielle Till with the Our Town Spotlight. I'm super excited about the guest that we have today, Nadia Victoria. Welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me. So there's something big happening, right? At least it's been open for a month and a half, month a new a restaurant yes. that's connected to Victoria's restaurant. There's a little bit of history. Can you share a little bit more about the name and what's it all about? Yeah, so Soralina's is a sister restaurant uh, to Victoria's restaurant. And that's what Soralina's means, little sister. Oh, I love that. Uh, so it's just kind of a spinoff um, of Victoria's. We kept a lot of the traditional popular dishes with a modern twist on Italian. Um, and we do have some fun new items on the menu as well. Awesome, and th it's a really cool concept when you walk in, beautiful ambiance. There's a, for pizza, a wood fire yep. pizza, correct? Right in the center of the restaurant. Right in yeah. the center. And then also a beautiful patio. I have driven by it a few times. Tell us a little bit more about the aesthetics and then the new items that are on the menu. Yeah, so uh, actually the patio just opened two weeks ago. We didn't open with it initially. And that will be a Four Seasons patio. Uh, so it's heated in there. It'll eventually be fully enclosed. We're waiting on the rest of the glass there. Um, but the, the space is very light, airy. Um, it's just uh, a lot more different than Victoria's that what people are used to there. Um, Which is more traditional. Right, right. Tra your yes. traditional Italian. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And this is just, um, like I said, modern and airy. I love it. And the new items that are on the menu yeah, so we have some fun pizzas. We have a lot more pizzas on the menu, but we do have some fun pizzas, like our Berry Fire Za is probably one of our most popular ones, which would be uh, strawberries and a balsamic glaze drizzle on the top mm. with prosciutto ham. Um, we do have like a meat lovers type of pizza. Um, we have a peach, uh, yeah, peach pizza as well. Um, and those are all fun. Too. Awesome. And you open this up with your cousin, Correct. right? I mean, this is not a new gig for you. You've been in the restaurant business. So how did that all shake out? So Jordan and I grew up together and it was just always kind of a dream to continue into the So you didn't business. fight. So you're... No. <laughs> no. That's awesome. Yeah. So he's like a little brother to me. Um, and then, yeah, so we just got to talking one day and we're like, oh, have you seen the location? Um, right by, it's right by the Apache Mall. And yeah, we've seen it, it was an old bank. And then it was like, oh, we should turn it into kind of a restaurant. And then it just kind of. That's neat how that kind of, yeah. you know, panned out. Yeah. Really awesome, it's a one-stop shop. You can go have, you know, a nice lunch and stop at the Apache Mall. Perfect, thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, this is Michael Wojak with your Our Town Rundown. I hope you are having a wonderful summer. There continues to be a lot going on here in Rochester. This weekend, some of the activities that you can check out is the Party in the Alley, and that's going to be going on in the alley behind Panacookin, just north of downtown on Broadway. Should be an interesting event with a lot of new businesses showing off their wares. Also, every Saturday morning at Graham Park, there is a farmer's market. It's attended by a lot in the community, and there's oftentimes free live music there. This weekend, it's going to be Pat Egan playing at 9 a.m. Also going on this Saturday, Much Ado About Nothing is being put on at Peace United Church by a new theater company. Now, what's interesting about this is they mix in current music. That is going to be going on this weekend and next weekend. 
On Sunday, there is an artist talk at the Rochester Art Center. Jeannie Hine Tran will be speaking at the Rochester Art Center at 11 a.m. and that event is free. And our Riverside concert this week is in vogue. The opening act starts at 7 p.m. Hope to see you there. This coming Tuesday is primary election day. If you haven't already voted, remember to vote. And if you're not sure where to go, you can follow the link to vote.org and that'll show you where you vote. It's easy to register to vote in Minnesota. Finally, on Thursday, the Diversity Council will be having their annual celebration. That's going to be at the History Center of Olmsted County and that starts at 4.30 p.m. You can take a look at the website link here to find out more information. Hope to see you out and about enjoying activities in our town. Danielle Till with our 10 Walkabout, and I'm excited we're at Cafe A Key in this beautiful ambiance at Sargent's. We're going to find out more how it got started. So I'm here with Sean and Michelle Fagan, and super excited we're at Cafe A Key in Sargent's. Lots of greenery, it's gorgeous. You have to set the stage. How did this come to be? We were out on our friend Nick Sargent's boat, and uh, he said, you know, I've been thinking about doing something to, to bring some new traffic to the Sargent's on Second Store. And he said, you know, I've been to Vancouver, there's this market there, it's beautiful, I love the vibe. Um, wouldn't it be cool to do something like that here? Well, we talked a little bit about the name of Key and kind yes. of where that came from. And I, I think everything we've touched upon pulls back to that, to our name. Mm -hmm. The word a key is Spanish for here. So the idea is to be here. We don't have a drive through That's intentional. Can you share a little bit more about this? So this is the Black Eagle. It's the Black Eagle. Yes. He's even got a cool name. <laughs> and uh, this machine is actually used in the World Barista Championships uh, for their competitions. And Can your um, baristas do the World Championship? They could compete someday if they, nice. if they would like. <laughs> um, coffee can get too sour, it can get too bitter. So our team is phenomenal at dialing it in. Every couple of hours they're dialing in that espresso, making sure it tastes perfect. When we travel, it's the kind of place that we hope to visit because um, we knew that it wasn't here before this. You see people studying, you see people working, you see a couple out on a date. Fantastic. The, just the idea of coming into a space that just makes you feel good and your shoulders drop, you come in, you get a treat, you're surrounded by beautiful nature and like a really cozy environment. What more can you ask for? Hey, this is Danielle Teal with our 10 Walkabout. I'm gonna drink my cup of coffee. <laughs> The City of Rochester recently welcomed Irene Woodward as Community Development Director. Irene joins us today to talk about the work of the Community Development Department and to tell us a bit about herself and her role. Welcome to our town and welcome to our town. <laughs> Thank you for having me <laughs> on both occasions. <laughs> yes. Um, so could you just give us a little bit of a refresher? What is community development? Yeah, so community development really covers a lot of different things from uh, building and development to planning to heritage preservation and urban design and neighborhoods and housing. So we cover a lot of different topics. So we really touch anything that's going on in the physical environment. So like if you see any housings going up or any large buildings, they have come through community development. So we really do get to get involved in a lot of different aspects. And how are everyday citizens interacting with community development? So we interact with the public on a lot of different cases. If they're coming in to get a permit to maybe put a deck on their house to um, part of it is when any larger plan or larger plot is going through, there's a planning and zoning uh, commission. We also have a heritage preservation commission. So um, we get people interacting with us, providing comments. They're also coming in to get permits. So, or there might be an inspection happening on their property. So I would say the public um, interacts very much with community development. So we interact a lot. Um, we try to be, um, provide that customer service to them, but they're probably seeing us and asking us questions. Um, well, the community development um, has already brought the UDC, the Unified uh, Development um, Code, to the City Council for approval. Um, what is a UDC and what is it going to help us facilitate? Yeah, so in 2018, the city adopted a new comprehensive plan. Um, and so as part of that comprehensive plan, the next aspect is really looking at some of the, the zoning and the overall land development manual, which we had in place, and it's updating that. So the UDC is kind of the new version that we're taking in. Um, the, the draft is out for people to look at. Um, it's going to be before um, the Planning and Zoning Commission next week on August 10th, um, and then before City Council for adoption in, in September. 
Um, but really we wanted to make sure, and a part of it is really making sure that the UDC aligns with our comprehensive plan. So it's updating that, we're trying to simplify things, we're trying to make it user friendly, so there's gonna be more diagrams, better language, it's a little bit more, a little bit easier for people to understand because it's a little bit of a daunting task sometimes. So part of that is really making sure that those aspects are incorporated. So we're hoping that it simplifies things um, and it's going to be a good tool for us moving forward. And you mentioned the public could take a look at it. Um, where, where could they find that? So you can, um, the city of Rochester, there is a community development page. There's a lot of great resources on it, both the UDC, but if there's questions of, related to permits, and anything else, we have a lot of uh, great resources and FAQs, so if you're like, do I need a permit for something, you can find a lot of that on our website as well. Perfect. Um, so you're new in this role. The, um, the department itself, um, if, I, if I'm correct, um, started in 2018, so it's relatively new. Um, what are you most excited about building upon and just growing? Yeah, so 2018, it's still very new. Um, I think part of us, you know, the department has really kind of come together in the last couple of years. Um, so what I'm really excited about is kind of, I think it's first and foremost, everything has kind of come together. And so like really looking at how we take that to the next level. Um, we've really started to like look at different planning areas. Um, we just finished a small area plan, which is really taking some aspects from our comprehensive plan and like focusing it on a smaller area. Um, and so some of that we're going to continue to do, um, identify areas within the city that we feel that it's appropriate. So I think that's going to be a really exciting aspect to continue to do and that will also really engage with the public um, and kind of create those planning, but as well as just kind of continually improving and looking at our processes and how we do things. Um, and obviously implementation just in various projects that are going on. So we stay pretty busy depending on what's going on and there's a lot of resources out there and we're trying to capture those and really um, make Rochester a better community and participate in that and kind of help that. Sure, and I, I imagine a big part of your work too is community engagement. So what, um, what is your vision, if you have one, of um, continuing to engage, especially our diverse communities here in really meaningful ways? Yeah, we, we do a lot of engagement with the community, both a lot of times we feel, I think we are informing people, but we're also asking for their feedback. Um, sometimes it's just for a short period of time. I think one of the things what we're really looking at as we kind of move forward is that continuous engagement. How do we not just like pop in and leave so that people also can like rely on, you know, that we're a resource as well. So I think it's, you know, with all community engagement, it's a continual process. We keep changing how we do it. Um, because we're learning as we go. So we want to figure out the best way to engage the community so that they feel that they're a part of it and that we're hearing what they're saying and that we're, that is really um, important for effectiveness. So I think as we continue, we have a, a great diverse community um, and figure out the best way to engage each one of those areas so that it's, it's appropriate and we get the feedback we need so that we can better serve them. So can you tell us a little bit about where you were before uh, you came here to us and um, why you chose to join the city of Rochester and make Rochester your home? Yes, yeah, so I most recently was in Pennsylvania. I spent the good majority of my career out there. Um, my background is in city planning, um, so I really um, saw this position and really what drove me here was the job at first, but when I came out here, I really liked the community aspect. There's the neighborhoods, the everything that's going on there's like so many great opportunities and I just saw I think the potential here and it was really exciting to me and to kind of I think a little bit of that planning background of like what's going on how does it all come together um, and and where do we go from here um, and I think even the fact that community development is relatively young as we just talked about um, that became a really good opportunity um, to kind of be part of that as it kind of moves forward um, so that's kind of how I ended up here that's fantastic. Um, so Eastern Pennsylvania, here to Rochester, um, you know, we are, we're, every community is unique, but are there some um, similarities or even just some lessons that you're taking from your previous um, home here with you? Yeah, so I w most recently was with the city of Allentown in Pennsylvania, which is also the third largest city. So um, I got to go from one third largest nice. city to another, <laughs> which is also very exciting. So, and the populations are somewhat similar. Mm -hmm. um, and so what's nice is like seeing the different concerns that communities are seeing are relatively similar so like how we address those becomes very important so really like looking at that and I feel like bringing some of that experience but also really like getting to know Rochester and what works here is kind of exciting to kind of think how best to serve this community. For sure. 
Um, as we're wrapping up here, can you just um, share a little bit about how people can stay in contact with community development and just find out more information and kind of stay on the pulse of what's going on? Yeah, I would, I would once again say like our uh, City of Rochester community development page is a great resource. Um, we, pr we try to put out as much information as possible so that people know what's going on. I think as things come up, we try to get them out to the community. Sometimes it's through mailings, sometimes um, it's, it's getting it posted, so you might see some of that, but we really want to make sure that our website becomes a key resource for people. So I'd highly recommend, you can just Google it too if you uh, can't find that, but it's, it's a great resource of information on the department. Yeah, and I know the city just revamped their website, so it's very user-friendly for sure. <laughs> it is, yes. Awesome, well thank you so much, Irene. Welcome again, and we look forward to talking to you again in the future. Great, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today. Coming to you from 125 Live, I'm Nicole Fenoy Amhara, host of Our Town, the show about Rochester. For more wonderful content produced right here in Rochester, please be sure to check us out on Facebook and Twitter at hashtag Our Town. Be well and stay safe. We'll see you next time. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.